Hello everyone, this is John Mark Johnson Jr. again, host of Relationship and Truth. And today I just thought I'd take the time to talk about uh, a fairly important uh, biblical manuscript, and that is P66. Um, this is just kind of a, a fun tidbits kind of, uh, of uh, interaction here, but... Um, I wanted to talk about it because uh, in the Logos course, one of the things that I did is I did a walkthrough of John 1.1 and how to pronounce it and those kinds of things. And so I wanted to talk about the earliest manuscript that contains John 1.1, which is P66. Um, according to Philip Comfort, P66 dates to the middle of the 2nd century. And he goes into a lot of detail on that. And if you want, you can go ahead and get um, Philip Comfort's commentary on the manuscripts and text of the New Testament. And he'll go into some detail on it and also in other things that he's done. Uh, earliest uh, New Testament uh, manuscripts, uh, their texts by Comfort and uh, Barrett also go into this kind of uh, material. Uh, and this is actually a, a somewhat interesting uh, kind of a uh, thing here and that p66 considering how old it is that it's middle of the second century so you know basically uh, around a hundred years after the time of Christ we already have a manuscript of the Gospel of John and it includes things clear into chapter 21 so from John chapter 1 clear into chapter 21 that's covers pretty much all of John. Of course, it's it's incomplete, uh, as a lot of the early manuscripts are. There's, there's holes in it and whatnot, and places where things are missing that happens. Uh, but it is a relatively complete manuscript, which is a rare thing for uh, being that early. Um, and then... Uh, I did want to talk a little bit about uh, the penmanship, just a little bit, just because it's interesting. In the very early uh, manuscripts, the penmanship actually somewhat resembled some of the lowercase forms that we have today. In uh, P66, there were three uh, different uh, scribes who worked on it. There was the original scribe, and these are examples of the way that he made some of his letter. Uh, our modern lowercase alpha compared to the alpha that he made. Now, at the time that he was making it, they didn't have a proper lowercase. But the way that he made his alpha was very similar to the way that we make alpha today. Uh, the second hand made an alpha that looked a lot like we would use a, a modern D today. Uh, but it wasn't a modern D. It was, it was alpha. And then by the time we get to the third hand, we start seeing a more typical uh, unseal form, what we'd normally associate with the, the old capital forms. Um, so it's kind of an interesting progression as time goes on. It actually looks more like our modern lowercase forms to uh, the old capital forms, but that was actually the progression. Um, and then the deltas were also a little bit different. They were basically triangles. Uh, back in the day, and the alphas also kind of were triangle, triangle-esque, but they usually had extension bars over the, uh, the triangle. The delta was a little bit more triangular. Uh, epsilon, and basically a C with a little line coming out of it that was fairly typical. Zetas looked a lot like a capital Z. Some of them had a, a hanging tail on them, and that eventually became the, the lowercase form that we have today that has the, the hanging tail on it. Uh, but once you start getting into the, the proper unsealed period, it didn't have a tail, and then they kind of reverted back. Um, Kappa pretty much has always stayed the same. It's basically a K. A Mu, again, we see what looks kind of like the modern uh, lowercase form, and then uh, later on as time goes on, it develops into the proper unsealed that we're more familiar with, and then later gets combined with lowercase forms that kind of go back to the old unsealed forms. So that actually is kind of an interesting thing. When you look at how uh, the case is developed, at one time all of these were considered uppercase letters. And then as time go and went on, they started kind of combining the, the current uppercase letters with the old uppercase letters and the, created the lowercase by going back to old uppercase, which is kind of interesting. Um, C... Um, I don't think that C has ever looked normal. Um, 
C is just a weird letter anyways. Uh, row, old form looked a lot like the modern row. Um, the third hands row was a little bit interesting just because of the way that they made it. Um, they didn't always complete the loop at the top, so theirs looks a little bit kind of like a, a backwards Y, which is kind of interesting. And then Upsilon, uh, the lowercase form of Upsilon that we have today is basically a U, but of course in all of the ancient papyri manuscripts they used a Y. Um, and of course the form of gamma that they used was different so they, there wouldn't be any confusion here but now it looks kind of like the lowercase gamma that we use today but again at the time there was no lowercase gamma all of these were considered uppercase as time went on it formed into the the proper y that we know today and the form that had the little loop on it was later on adopted as the lowercase form and you can see all of that in one manuscript here in p66 the first two hands um, use the the older forms and then by the time that we get into the third hand it starts going into the proper uncial form and, um, and then later on with other manuscripts down the line we'd have the proper uncial form getting combined with the old uncial form to form uppercase and lowercase letters as we know them today and of course there's a little bit of modify modification and change but um, very interesting how some of those things uh, went on um, just all kinds of interesting, not really here nor there, but just interesting bit tidbits of history, you know. Um, yeah, but we definitely don't make the letters that way anymore, and it could be very confusing to read them. All right, but let's get into actually looking at the uh, the main text that we're talking about in Logos, which is John 1.1. 1, 1. And unfortunately, this aperture doesn't have all of the, the pictures, but these are ones that I paid for, so I will go ahead and use them. Let's see if I can get this balanced here. So this is the beginning of the Gospel of John, and that's what P66 is. It's a it's a Gospel of John manuscript. And unfortunately, like I said, this particular version isn't all that easy to read. But you can make it out. Uh, the first word here at the top is euangelion, uh, which we would normally translate as gospel or good news. You could also translate it as triumph. Uh, what it was is uh, the revelation of news that was that was positive for the people who were listening to it. Um, it was the telling of something uh, that would have an overall positive effect for the people that were listening to it. So, in the typical Roman world kind of thinking, you know, you you're talking about what is good for uh, the Roman Empire, and you're usually talking about uh, a tale of the army going out and, and conquering their foes, so it was a, a story of a triumph. And um, the Gospels actually play off of that definition a little bit, so euangelion there, it's not just simple good news, but there is the connotation, the, the historical connotation of this being a uh, as in a sense a triumph, not necessarily a military triumph like the Romans would use it, but the sense of this story being something that has led to uh, the revelation of something that is good for you. Because this happened over here, your situation is now better. Something was done over here and you benefit as a result of it. Even though you weren't a part of the events, you benefit from it. That was kind of always an implied understanding of euangelion. It's good news about something that happened over here that affects you positively, even though you didn't necessarily have any a hand in what happened over there. So when we talk about the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're said in this kind of a context, and the idea is that this is good news. This is something uh, good that happened um, and it can uh, affect other people positively, even though those, those people weren't a part of the, uh, the original story. It was understood right from the get-go when you're talking to people, this is something that is good for you. This isn't just an account of something that happened to this guy named Jesus, but this is something uh, that is significant because it can uh, apply to you positively. Okay, so... There's that, so euangelion, and then the next word here, and unfortunately the tau is kind of faded, uh, but it's kata, kata, and then, and this one is really hard to make out, but it's yuanain, yuanain, kata yuanain, 
Uh, kata is basically according to in this context. Yoannein is uh, John, uh, John the Apostle. So uh, the triumph according to John or the good news according to John. And that's how it started out. And a lot of times in the early manuscripts, the titles are fairly short. Um, sometimes it would just be the, the name of uh, the gospel writer, just Yoan name. Um, this one is actually a little bit longer than, than some of them. Uh, but you get into later manuscripts, and sometimes they'll have a very, uh, a very full title. You know, this is the gospel according to John, the apostle of the Lord, um, evangelist and revelator, da 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 da. It just goes on and on and on. Uh, but the early manuscripts usually kept it very, fairly short and simple. Um, just basically enough to introduce who this is from and why it's important to read this. This is good news. Um, that has positive implications for you, or at least can have positive implications for you. And then you go ahead and you get into the main text. Um, and I'll go ahead and read it through here. Now, reading unsealed text, especially the old form unsealed, actually the really old form unsealed text, like you get in these really early second, third, uh, second and third century manuscripts, actually isn't too bad because a lot of the forms are pretty similar to the lowercase forms that we use today, so it's actually not terrible. Uh, but as you can see, there aren't really spaces between words, which is annoying. There's really not much in the way of punctu punctuation either. And of course, since this is a really old manuscript, this was, you know, back in the second century. So, I mean, nearly 2,000 years old, but not quite. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's old and it's faded and it's kind of hard to read, especially in this form. This is, this is not exactly the best picture in the world, but it's what I have available to me. Uh, so I'm using it. But uh, you have N, so first two letters there is Epsilon Nu, N, Arche, Alpha, Rho, Gi, Eta, Ain, another Eta, Nu, N, Arche, Ain, Ha, and there was no breathing marks at the time. Uh, breathing marks is something that kind of developed as time went on, but originally there really wasn't much in the way of breathing marks or punctuation in general. So you just kind of had to know the language and how things would be pronounced. Uh, so this is supposed to have a rough breathing mark on it, but of course early on they didn't really have it, so you just had to know your text. So ha, and then logos, and it uses the, the capital form of gamma, which is basically just an angle bar, kind of like a little, little hangman's bar. So, uh, there's Lambda, Omicron, Gamma, Omicron, Sigma, the old Sigmas look like C's, Alagas, and then this word here is Chi, and you can see the alpha in there. It looks a lot like a modern alpha, but this was actually considered to be, no, well, there was no lowercase form, but it is technically a capital form for the time, unsealed for the time. So kai, and then this is ha again. It doesn't have the forward apostrophe like it normally would in a modern text, but it's ha. Ha, and then logos. This logos is easier to make out. You have the lambda there, omicron, gamma, omicron, sigma, ha, logos, aim, and then aim again. Uh, and part of the new got scratched out there. And then pros, p, rho, omicron, sigma, pros, and then this part of the manuscript uh, got broken off, so you have ta, it should be tan theon, um, and the theon would be, uh, in a nomina sacra form, it would be abbreviated to just theta, new, and have a little overbar of it, but it's not there because the manuscript got broken off, and so that's not present anymore. And P66 is actually in really good condition for as old as it is, because a lot of the manuscripts that come from the same time period are not so great. Uh, the other major manuscript from the this time period is, of course, P52, and P52 is just an itty-bitty fragment. Um, it's, it's absolutely tiny. Not much of it survived at all. Uh, so, considering that its nearest contender is P52, and P52 just has literally a few words, um, P66 is actually in pretty good shape. And then so it would be pros, ton, theon, and then you have chi again, chi, theos, and this is nomina sacra. You have theta and sigma here. And what's interesting about the thetas, the older thetas, and some of them is that you see that the bar, uh, 
not only goes through theta, but it sticks out on either end, which is kind of interesting. And you might be looking at this saying, you know, theos, that should probably have a few more letters than just two, like some vowels in there. Well, again, this is nomina sacra. So this is actually an abbreviation. They take the first letter, last letter, and put an overbar above it. So this is theos. And then we have ain, ha. Like I said, there's no rough breathing mark there, but it's ha. Halagos. And that brings us to the end of John 1.1. 1, 1. Now, one thing that is kind of interesting here is you do have occasional marks that seem to indicate some kind of a, a stop for a thought or a sentence and stuff like that. Um, but again, some of these marks were put in after time and stuff like that. In most of the early manuscripts, you don't necessarily see that, but this one does seem to have intentional space for it. And so that is interesting that there's that it has these stops in it. And this is an indication that this manuscript was meant to be read aloud to people. This is a manuscript that was made for active use in uh, the church. It was meant as a reading text. It has places in it to tell the, the person to, to stop here a little bit longer because this is a complete sentence, things like that, things to help the reader out. Um, a lot of the manuscripts that you see, though, don't necessarily have all those kinds of things unless it actually is meant to be read. So we can be pretty confident that this was meant to be read aloud to a congregation because at the time, a lot of people couldn't read. So the way that you got the information to them is you read it out loud. And so you'd make the text so that you could read it out loud. And the font size on this one is actually fairly large compared to a lot of them. So it was made to be easy to read. Has stop marks in there so you can come to the end of sentences and thoughts and stuff like that. Uh, so it was definitely made to be read out loud. So this is basically the text that they'd be reading from on, uh, say, a Sunday morning or something like that, while the congregation is in full hearing, those kinds of things. And of course, uh, old style of um, uh, congregation, they would all be standing for this, of course, as uh, the Gospel of John would be read to them. And that's how this would have been used. And amazingly, we still have it today. We can still see the, the stop marks. We can go through and read it. All those kinds of things. Um, just absolutely amazing to think about that we still have something like this. Um, this is mostly just me <laughs> geeking out, of course, but I wanted to, to share that with you guys. And uh, in this particular module uh, that I got, it goes through and it does an actual transcript of the text. Even though it doesn't include all the pictures, it has a transcript of the text in more or less a modern thought with spaces between words and punctuation and things like that. It's really great. And you can see places where the manuscript is incomplete. It'll put the, the letters in gray to uh, show you what should have been there. But of course, the, the page felt uh, that part of the page broke off and whatnot. So you don't have it anymore, but it used to be there. And some pages in P66 are pretty complete. In fact, a good many of them are fairly complete. And then some of them, well, not so much. I'm trying to find some of the ones that aren't so complete. Yeah, let's skip down to the end here. Yeah, here's a good example of one. Uh, you get into, like, say, chapter 17 of John, and it becomes pretty fragmentary. You get a lot of the pages that are torn off and whatnot, and only a few of the the letter, uh, letters on the page uh, survive. And so it's, that's fairly typical for something this old. Uh, the fact that we actually do have some really good pages is, is different. Um, and some of them you only get like one side of the page and things like that. That happens too. And uh, typical for older manuscripts, but what's amazing is that we can still tell what the, the pages were supposed to have on them because they match up with uh, the more recent manuscripts quite well. You can tell what was supposed to be there for the most part with pretty much no problem whatsoever. There's a few places here and there where you're, you'll have a little bit of a question, but that's usually because there's other textual variants there and they're not quite sure which. Um, but for the most part, you can reconstruct them pretty well. Um, so yeah, the, the dark part is what is properly in the manuscript. The gray part is what would have been there, but has since been, you know, been worn away by the ravages, uh, ravages of time, things like that. And so yeah, it's, it's pretty uh, cool to have access to all these kinds of things. It's just simply stunning to me to think that we can have something that's clear from the second century uh, that would have been read to a Christian congregation out loud. This is what they would have been reading in their time. And it says the same thing as what the Bible does today. Um, in English, that first sentence that I read to you guys, get to the transcript here, and Arche Halagas. In the beginning 
was the Word. Kahalagas in prastan theon. And the Word was toward uh, God, or was with God. And kaitheas uh, in halagas, and the Word was God. Now there's a little bit more subtlety there in how the Greek works and all that kind of thing, but as far as translation is concerned, it's the same thing. It hasn't changed in thousands of years. Um, the modern versions that we have are substantially identical to the early versions. Uh, there is no core Christian doctrine or theology that is, you know, ever been placed, um, you know, at, in any kind of position of dubiousness due to an earlier manuscript. Yes, there are some textual variants, of course, and that kind of thing, and we need to work through those. Uh, but none of them in and of themselves af affect any core uh, doctrine or theology, which is just absolutely amazing to think about and that we can confirm major Christian teachings like a, a, such as is found in John 1.1 1, 1, by going back to these really early manuscripts. Um, absolutely amazing resource that we have. I geek out when I think about these things, and I just kind of wanted to share that with you guys. So thank you for your time and attention. Uh, for those of you who are in Christ, go with God and be blessed. For those of you who are not, I pray that you would come to an understanding of the true Christ of history, the only genuine Savior of mankind. Amen.